does he think he is and that theme was the refrain of his sermon as he spoke to eulogize a man who defined for himself possibilities and purpose that went way beyond the station of his birth possibilities and purpose and a society that was structured to denude ordinary people of agency of their own sense of masculinity or femininity and that was intended to treat them as pawns in the order and purpose of others his was a life that challenge those assumptions and they challenge those assumptions because he believed that his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren like all of the others around him like all of the others in this city of Bridgetown which he represented between 1944 and 1971 should have the ability to be the best that they could be. He believed that the people like Gabby or Al Jilks or Roald Branca, all of whom were born in this city of Bridgetown, should be given the opportunity to rise and to have that sense of purpose. So that when Canon Isaacs asked me to speak here today, on Barbados beyond 2019 the one thing that seized my imagination was how do we inspire in those who come and who must come to adulthood beyond 2019 that sense of purpose and that sense of passion to make this country move to levels, as Kofi Annan would say, to punch above its way. A country does not exist in a vacuum. It is the collective of the people. And if we understand that, we appreciate, therefore, that the goals that we have set ourselves to be able to inspire others and to imbue in them that sense of purpose and passion are perhaps the most important contribution that we can make to nurturing the next generation. We cannot protect them from hurricanes and gale force winds as we now know. We cannot protect them from electricity blackouts as we now know. We cannot protect them from misfortune but we must prepare them to be resilient and to be purposeful and to be compassionate and to be passionate. And that journey requires therefore being able to pull together and to build a society that values these attributes more than it values most things. A society that understands that opportunity is the handmaiden of these attributes to which I just spoke. A society that equally reflects the purpose and commitment in those who are older to recognize the role that they must play. My government has set out some very simple objectives for our period in office in this country. 
we believe that we can build a better and stronger Barbados. But we believe that that better and stronger Barbados is the sum total of the actions of our people. And that it is our duty over the course, if the people of this country allow us, at least over the course of the next decade, to lay the foundation that will secure the next 50 years of our nation as an independent country. And the way that we do it is by unleashing the purpose and passion in our people. The development strategy of those who went before in colonial times was reflected in their commitment to an education system and an education law that was designed to focus on the top 40% and to carry along the rest, to be orderly, to be capable of taking instructions and not to get outside of themselves and beside themselves. And we know this only too well. But we have recognized that this country cannot be built on just 40%. It's too large a structure for us to carry. And that from as far back as 1995 when I presented the education white paper, Each One Matters, it was a signal that each child has to be given the opportunity to become the best that he or she could be. And that process of deconstructing our educational system regrettably has taken far longer than we would have hoped for because ingrained in us is not only education through the school system but I regret to say Karen Isaacs and Reverend Lashley education through the church education through the community education through the institutions of the country that are still ordered regrettably in a time pass for a people pass and for a purpose that is not our own. That is what Marcus Garvey was referring to when he said emancipate yourselves from mental slavery none but ourselves shall free our minds. And our educational system cannot be about training lawyers and doctors, priests and teachers, but it has to be about unleashing a purposeful, compassionate, passionate, disciplined, creative citizen. We've said that by 2030, every child under the age of 18 must be prepared for their lives that they can live in order to help unleash this country's greatest potential. That they must be capable of speaking a second language because we live in a world today that requires us to engage and not look inward. That we must produce global citizens with Barbadian roots. We say that we must teach them to swim because you cannot live on an island and not know how to cross the seas or be in the seas, literally and metaphorically. We say that we must teach them a sport because most sports teach us that in life we can lose and still be an honorable person. We can win and still have to be compassionate and charitable. And they teach us that week after week after week after week until it is ingrained in us as an intrinsic characteristic of who we must be. We say that you must teach them some form of artistic discipline, whether to sing, whether to play music, whether to paint, whether to carve, whether to write, whether to do poetry. Why? Because it connects them to a sense of compassion and creativity that makes them a different person. And that is why we believe that we must bring together, as we will shortly be doing, examples of creative excellence in Caribbean civilization just to talk for a weekend. Because they 
The artists determine what is possible and we the governments do what is probable. But you can't do what is probable without first identifying what is possible in this Caribbean civilization. And we finally say that they must learn some element of business and how to take risks. Because we have come along and our concept of business in the early days post-independence built on a pre-independence indoctrination is that only those who can belong to the big six could be considered as good businessmen ignoring the fact that this country has produced entrepreneurs even before slavery in the thousands people who had to make ends meet and who knew how to take risk and to go out into the sunshine or the rain as hawkers as farmers as tradesmen selling their goods and selling their services but then you hear that Barbadians are not risk takers or good businessmen but how do you explain people from the north to the south from the east to the west day in day out selling legal and illegal regrettably and making a way for their families how do you ignore the reality that we have among us a credit union movement whose roots lie perhaps more in the civic and the landship than anything else that bring together the collective savings of individuals for the benefit of the majority that today comes close to two billion dollars controlled not by managers in North America or Europe but controlled by people like you and me in this society managing the credit unions so that if we can teach our children and prepare our children such that by 2030 those simple things being bilingual being able to swim being exposed to an artistic and a sporting discipline and being shepherded in how to take risk how to be an entrepreneur how to understand that you can have a good idea do it and lose but that does not mean that you become downpressed and you do not try again and again and again in the line language of Jimmy Cliff because you can succeed if you really want to ultimately now you may ask why is she talking about that because if we create more and more of those citizens what are the chances of them feeling alienated in their own society what are the chances of them risking life and limb to do ignorance either on the road or to themselves or an antisocial behavior what are the chances of them being confident enough to take on a world not frightened to look at landscape that is different from ours being resilient enough to know that they will live in a world where uncertainty is going to be the only certainty for them where for six months of the year they will behave in spite of access to technology as their foreparents had to behave without the benefit of technology to prepare and be resilient not to get ready for the hurricane season but to be eternally ready for any climatic event because that is the world in which we have been pitched as a result of the climate crisis and that crisis comes in many forms and shapes it doesn't only come in the form of a storm or a hurricane or a flood how many people have ever known St. Lucie to flood before how many people and yet two weekends ago I moved from community to community to community in St. Lucie dealing with the horrors of what that water wrought on the people of that parish doesn't only come in that way the groundwater crisis 
that we face as a nation is fundamentally a product of the climate crisis. The increased salinity in some of our wells forcing us to take alternative decisions and perspectives as to how we will supply affordable fresh water because without water there is no life. And is Barbados unique in this? Far from. The whole Midwest of the United States of America has a water crisis. Honduras, throughout this region, throughout South America, throughout Asia, water is going to become the new oil. A liter of water is more expensive even as we speak than a liter of oil. Food security will become the ever most objective because the climatic crisis will disrupt production in other countries and it will equally disrupt logistics because if shipping routes are affected boats cannot get to far-flung territories in a hurry and the approach taken in world war ii that required of our farmers a commitment to plant 12 and a half percent of their acreage for the purpose of food is one to which my government is continuing to refer and study because our ability to be able to be food secure not in everything that we eat because that's impossible but in a few things that can keep people safe and capable of living, we have to commit. My recent trip to Suriname was entirely about that. And the Surinamese government have been gracious enough to recognize that they are not in the hurricane belt and that they and Guyana will have to anchor the Caribbean in our quest for food security and to reduce the five billion US dollars a year that we spend importing food into this region. That they do not suffer from hurricanes means that their risks are significantly reduced as compared to the rest of us in terms of being able to maintain crop and production. And we have determined that we who lack land must now access land in a different space in order to boost our production. As a result, I shall announce formally again on Thursday, tomorrow after cabinet, that those persons, and they are looking initially for 25 farmers, 15 in vegetable production, and 10 interested in aquaculture, where we will allow them to go there and use the land and between the governments of Suriname and Barbados to start the trial project as to whether we can use Suriname as a basis for food production in order to secure an independent Barbados beyond 2019. I am sure that the similar discussions will take place in Guyana because in 2007 October I was able at that time to reach a conclusion for a similar agreement and regrettably we lost office and that agreement went the way of all flesh. It is my government's intention to make sure that we create these opportunities for our young people and who believe that they can grow from strength to strength and become pioneers and major entrepreneurs in their own right. So food security and water in this ever-changing, uncertain world is going to become the most critical aspect of what we have to contend with. And then we have to contend with the fact that we live in a world where if we are not careful, might will always want to be right. And those of us who come from small jurisdictions or those of us who come from populations who know what it is to be unfair and exploited for the majority of our history appreciate that it is only where the rule of law anchored by a spirit of social justice triumphs 
that there is the ability to breathe freely and to truly embrace freedom for our people. Whether it is in the Caribbean, whether it is in Asia, whether it is in Africa, this is the new talk. And it is the new talk because we have seen others ignore the fact that having gone through the worst spectacles that mankind could go through in World War II, having settled on the basic mutual respect we should have for each other, we are now returning to a world where you must do what I tell you to do because I say you must do it because I can shame you and put you on a blacklist as if blackness is something negative to be triumphed and trumpeted or that I can name and shame you and deny you access to resources because you don't do as I say you ought to do. Well, those of you in this church know better than me that that sounds like a description of those who lorded over people at a time when freedom was not flowing freely through our veins and through our lands. It is unacceptable. And we have to work with others to fight it. For we cannot do it on our own. The principle of unionism that Grant Lee Adams and you World Springer fought for is that unity is strength. The principle of the strength of the credit union movement is that the collective savings of all is strength. And if we were to assess the resources of the credit union as compared to the richest in this land, the credit union's resources and that of the 100,000 members that it has is still larger than any single entity in Barbados at this point in time. Problem is that we live in a world that has seen greater income inequality and therefore our duty is to continue to stay focused and stay the course to build the kind of society that has a large middle class because it gives ordinary people the opportunity to rise from the bowels of poverty and to speak for themselves and for their children and to grasp opportunity to build for their families. That is why we reintroduced free tertiary education last year, even being in the middle of an IMF program. And that is why we are so committed to the deconstruction and the reconstruction of our educational system to produce those children by 2030 to which I've referred. There's one thing that we haven't dealt with sufficiently and that on reflection we may have to add to the mix and that is the ability for our children to be confident in the face of power to be confident in environments of the establishment the same children that will run out there and be boisterous and rebellion will come in here and you ask them their name and you have to lean down to hear it. The same children that will go into a workplace as Kim will tell you and you can't get them even though they know the answer to a problem to open up their mouth and say respectfully this is what I see or this is how I feel even if it is to disagree. And I have said to people, I argue strongly, but I expect you to argue back as strong with me as I argue. Because it is only through that expression of confidence and that respect of each other that we are going to be able to allow the best ideas to contend and to be able to perfect this journey that we are making called nation building. But it's not going to happen when there are adults. It's going to happen when they're children and perhaps there are some sayings that we have embraced that need to be mollified or adapted when we tell children you are to be seen and not to be heard that is part and parcel of an education system or a religious system that believed more in order than in the expression of creativity 
and then they boast through no confidence. And we have therefore to understand that this is a mission-wide, a mission-critical activity that has to be nationwide. We have to be able equally to let children play games with you as adults. Cards, dominoes, monopoly, cricket, beach cricket, table tennis, way. Because children must learn that they can master the art and skill of a game. Beat you as an adult, but still need to respect you as an adult. And that lesson is far greater with concomitant benefits of confidence than simply telling them you must be seen and not heard. We cannot suppress the spirit of our people if we want them to be purposeful and passionate. And what is required in that? That we step outside of our duty to ourselves, to our family, to our job, to our church. We step outside of the temple of our familiar or our comfort levels and start to engage again with those across the community who need help, guidance, and company. Ours is a society that has taken on too many of the attributes of Western civilization with the pursuit of individual prosperity or the pursuit of individualistic ambitions consuming us without realizing that it is only in giving that we shall grow. The meaning expressed in much of the New Testament still carries as much relevance today as it has since it was first being propagated. And those universal values of love, of charity, of selflessness, of service, are fundamentally what this country needs to be trumpeting in order to fly high again, in order to sustain the high flight again. We have known what it is to be able to transform a country as we have done. But have we finished the journey? No. Have we lost ground in some instances? Regrettably, yes. Can we make it up? Of course. Those who sought to plan rebellions as I expressed as to the people of Ghana in their parliament on Friday didn't give up the struggle simply because they met one failure. It caused them to be resilient. And we have today in our midst to determine as those who have walked beyond the state of childhood into maturity to appreciate that we have a duty to others in our community to carry them with us. We talk about payment of taxes but how many of us are prepared to give time? And time is the most important currency in the building of this nation. I have forever, and Kim, you will remember this, contend that productivity in Barbados is not a quantitative function. It's a qualitative issue, it's a cultural issue. That if Bajans are with you, they are going to go with you to the end of the earth, regardless of the consequences. And that is why in this country, for a certain generation and over, the most important words and the strongest phrase is what? We is we. When a Bajan tell you we is we, lock it down. You know you good. 
And that is why those who visit this land say oh Barbadians are not as friendly as Trinidadians and Jamaicans. Trinidadians and Jamaicans will invite you home and line with you. They just take the time. But once they get to know you and they believe in you, you can lock it down and know that they are going to go the entire journey with you regardless. Now I say that because in where and how we work, we forget these things and we choose instead a form of leadership and management that is of the plantation system that denudes the very same people in the way in which I referred at the beginning of my talk as to the times in which my grandfather was born into and if we know that it was uncomfortable for our grandparents and our great-grandparents to be treated that way. How do we reflect that style of management and that style of leadership, not just in a post-independence Barbados, but in a Barbados that is now seeking to secure the second 50 years of its first centenary as a modern independent state? These are the things that keep me awake at night. These are the things that ultimately will determine how productive we are as a nation, how safe we are as a nation, how healthy we are as a nation, how friendly we are as a nation, how engaging of the world we are as a nation, and how we can embrace people of all diversity. But in order for us to do that, we who have left childhood, must be prepared to take the stand and to give of our time and to take our children on that journey. This government has made some difficult decisions with respect to the future of our young people. We discovered that we were training and educating 9,000 less people per year than at its height just over a decade ago. I already referred to the reintroduction of free tertiary education in order to boost the numbers at all of the institutions. But the one reality that we had to confront is that there are some people who may not be ready for post-secondary institutions. And whether we like it or not, boys and girls in their teenage years in particular will play and do things to test and to explore. Let's take guns and cars and bikes. They'll either do it the right way or they're going to do it on their own, the wrong way and illegally. We can either take them and put them in sea cadets and cadets and the Barbados Youth Advance Corps or we can leave them to explore their own curiosity on the block behind somebody's house in the middle of a patch without purpose and without passion. And we therefore determined that we would have to find the money because this matters in building out this nation. And that at the height of when it is fully functional with a thousand people per year for two years, meaning that at any one time it will have 2,000 people enrolled, that it will cost us in excess of $22 million. That's a major commitment. But that cost is far less than the cost of lives and people being shot. The cost of full prisons. The cost of families that are separated and divided. Breeding another set of young people to come up ankleless and valueless. So the $22 million all of a sudden looked like a small number. And the cabinet committed to it. And I'm happy that we have effectively taken in the second intake of 250. The president of Suriname and I spoke about the possibilities of exchanges. Because the greatest gift that we could give if we had all the money in the world, Karen Isaacs, when we return prosperity to this nation, is to give every young person the opportunity to spend two months, three months, six months 
outside of this island and to be exposed to understand that they are global citizens that they must manage every environment that they must deal with all kinds of people that they must be appreciative of other languages beyond English and Belgian so my friends that is the kind of Barbados that we want one that is defined collectively by the kind of young Barbadian we want to build and nurture and foster such that they will speak with purpose and passion from this pulpit from this lectern from that square from that school at St. Mary's from wherever they are in this nation recognizing that ours is a relay race to run and that the most that can be asked of each of us is to secure the baton hold it carry it and pass it on as trustees of a civilization that is first and foremost regional with a Barbadian tweak a Barbadian accent a Barbadian nuance but it is a regional civilization that has seen us rise together and fall together and that we are separated only by ocean not by history not by genes not by circumstances not by challenges and that in appreciating that that we will then work together to fight and wrestle down the big challenges that will inevitably come in this century globally and regionally I tire of saying that we didn't cause the climate crisis we don't produce the greenhouse gases to even move the needle but we are on the front line of the climate crisis and the notion of climate refugees of people having to give up all that they own and move and live is truly part and parcel of our new world Montserratians know it with the volcano Barbudans know it with the hurricane people of Abaco know it with the hurricane the people of Dominica know it and do you recover in quick order? no do some ever recover? probably not but that has been the way of history we don't have plagues as they did in historic times this is our new plague and just as those who lived then determined themselves that they would be resilient to endure we must prepare ourselves to be resilient to be purposeful to have a sense of purpose to have a passion to have compassion to be creative and to be committed to a collective call the nation state the community and the family to make it a better place to allow people to sleep easier when the night comes to allow people to dream to allow people to embrace opportunity and to allow us to be the best that we can be that is what Grantley Adams and Errol Barrow fundamentally sought to create for us but in this Barbados 2.0 the challenges come in different forms in different images but the antidote remains the same the power and passion of the people hone it and we shall succeed ignore it at our peril and we shall fall thank you and happy independence i'm conscious that there may be some questions i toyed with the idea of not giving a speech and just doing questions and when i saw the look on canon isaac's face i decided let me change that one day No, the Prime Minister has to leave. Uh, 
ten past two. So we will take a few questions. Get on. Thank you, Dad. I think that religion is absolutely essential, not as religion, but the spiritual development of our people. And regrettably, we have abandoned the notion that feeding the spirit matters. A child doesn't know that intrinsically. A child can only be taught that. And perhaps the greatest disservice we do to our children is not exposing them to that reality. So that I feel strongly that every child needs to be rooted in the church or the mosque or whatever spiritual collection or collective there is because I believe in the diversity as well. But at the same time, I also believe that, and I've said this to Santia, that we have to engage in serious parental education in this country. I felt it as Minister of Education, I feel it even more now. Because if a parent does not know what matters, how to not feed a child coke, how to root a child in the church, how not to hit a child to the point where it becomes abuse, how to nurture a child's respect for certain values and above all else that with every choice that you make comes a consequence and that you have to be prepared to accept it as they told us hard is you weren't here or where you gonna walk and those are the sayings and you hear me use a lot of these sayings in my speeches why because it's easier to resonate and to collect, connect with people when I say it because people immediately say it's true. It's true. Whereas if I try to explain it in a technical and boring way, the message does not go the same way. So that within our bosom, there's already a distinguished tradition. And how is it that we have children, raising children, and not appreciating that they need to be fed both food that we know and spiritual food that they need. Everything I spoke about today is rooted in the Bible. Now there are some who will argue that religion sometimes has lost its way and that's true but so have we. And it's not religion that's lost its way, it's people within the context of religion. So that that is just a poor excuse for laziness and insensitivity and incapacity to appreciate the importance of purpose in the life of a child. If you say you love this child, why would you expose this child to be naked in a world that will exploit it? Why would you expose this child to be valueless in a world that will exploit it? So the short answer is absolutely yes. When they become an adult, they can make decisions for themselves. But the early groceries, as my father would tell you, is the most important ingredient in the raising of children. Are there any more questions? Time is of the essence, but we can take two more questions or there. The, the men with barreling voices and hear all of a sudden Mika's mouse. <laughs> Mika's a mouse. Mr. Edgell, I was talking about you. <laughs> it's, there's one. Richard. Yes, yeah.
The greatest discipline is buttressed not by flogging but by love. Love and a desire not to bring shame and not to embarrass. And that is rooted in a sense of identity that says that, look, I am not going to embarrass my mother or father because that's how they raised me. Now, what has happened is that flogging has become a, an abbreviated way of expressing yourself to control a situation. And I'm not going to tell you that some level of a lash or two is bad because people respond in different ways to different things. What I think we have to be clear about is that corporal punishment in the form of abuse is completely unacceptable. But a lash never hurt nobody with a ruler or a belt. I must confess that I didn't get any. <laughs> that may either have been that I was very good or that I knew not how to avoid it. Um, but the bottom line is that I really feel that the most powerful weapon is love. And that's what the Bible says. And, and, and that is why, look, the majority of our people are good people. The majority of our people are rooted in the right way. What has happened is that we have allowed the example of a few to take the nation hostage and to become the example that we spend so much time talking about that we don't celebrate the goodness and the virtues of excellence when we find it in our communities and when we find it in our country. Last night I asked the people of this country, yesterday morning I asked the people of this country to look out for each other and to be there for each other in this difficult moment that we had. You know how blessed this country is? You know that other parts of the world, if they had endured what this country endured the last two days, that the results could have been far, far, far different but that's not who we are but there are a few people and, and what we fail to appreciate that in many instances Jeddah and you would better appreciate this as a former policeman that we don't disaggregate the reasons why people behave inappropriately in some instances there are mental issues but a society that does not confront the reality of mental disease does not treat to it properly. There are some instances of people doing it out of pure wickedness, yes. But there are other instances where it is functionally something that is wrong. And that is why I continue to argue that one of the most important roles of a school is also to diagnose and to monitor, and diagnose and monitor. When a child's parents are divorced, and that child all of a sudden behaving and acting up in the school. Do we go behind the acting up to find out what is the root problem? Or do we beat it out of them? You have to go behind it. There are people in their 70s and 80s I know today who behave in a certain way. And then when you really get into why they're behaving so, they felt that the mother loved the brother and sister more than they loved them. I see all of you nodding. So these are the things, and the problem is that governments traditionally have been structured to deal with the hard things, the economics of the nation, the other things that are strong institutional. Well, governments are now learning across the world that soft power and people development matter. But when Grant Adams and Errol Barrow were saying so, everybody looked at them as if something was wrong with them. And they had that sense of purpose and passion like my grandfather at the time that they came along because they knew what it was to deconstruct to have to deconstruct a system that dehumanized us and the rest of the world understands now that it wasn't only about winning the dehumanization battle 
But it is also about when you win it, what do you have? You have proud and productive people. And what do proud and productive people do? They create, they earn. And all of a sudden, that which the governments wanted in terms of economic growth and prosperity is on our doorstep without even realizing it. There is an inextricable link to treating and nurturing our people well and raising them up to be rooted, to withstand any hurricane or gale force winds because they're rooted. Expose me to anything. Expose me to anybody. You can't make me do wrong. None but ourselves can free our minds. And if that is the way in which we raise our children where there's a moral compass, where they understand that right is right and wrong is wrong and there's no two ways of mixing it. And if you do wrong, there's a consequence. Pray that the consequence is only an apology, but if it is more than an apology, accept it. These are not high brown philosophical issues, but these are the essence of what it is to be human and what it is to raise human beings. And simply put, governments have therefore to unlock themselves to embrace and unleash the power of the society by working collectively with the church, with the community groups, with the creative groups, the sporting groups. When last have you seen a community group or a dance group or a sporting group formed in your community? When last? And when I ask that question, I can tell you when last. In Huddersfield Turning, we formed one two, three years ago. Why? Because when I ask the question, the next question I ask is what are we going to do about it? Because the persons who are able-bodied and working or retired are the ones who have to come together and work with the young people. There was a giant of a man called Harold Nurse. Harold Nurse was the treasurer of Friendship Youth Group for over 30 years. That is why I named the community center in Hathersal Turning after him. He saw generation after generation after generation of young men and women. The ones playing basketball, the ones that eventually went into Yorkshire Cricket Club, the ones that were in St. Matthew's Church. If you don't build communities by giving back our time, not to the rum shops alone, that may well be important, but to the community. When last have you seen men belong to cricket clubs or football clubs? Going there every afternoon, a young boy, 16 years old, doesn't have a father figure in the house. Grandmother, mother, miserable sometimes. He don't know how to talk, they don't understand him. He don't understand them. He take a liking to a fella, not in that way, to a man who is one of his elders in the cricket club. Realize that the man is asked after him every evening. Sometimes the man is dropping home. One evening, dropping him home, he says to the man, sir, I can ask you a question. The man said, of course. He said, you know, I went and get myself in trouble and get this girl pregnant. Boy, you know what to do. Don't know how he going to face life. And that's why we reintroduced tertiary education. Because if you then ask that same boy who get one girl or two girls pregnant, to find the money that he would now have to find for Pampas to go to pay at UE or the Polytechnic or Community College, he ain't going. Because the first person that's making him miserable every week is who? The child mother. So that I am trying to tell you that our government has to be real, our conversations have to be mature. You cannot reach 53 years as a nation and not have mature conversations. This country has to deal with mental illness. This country has to deal with diversity. This country has to deal with a number of things. It does not mean that we change the essence of the universal values that keep us who we are. And above all else, we must be our brothers and sisters keeper. The first time I heard about a share pot mentality is in the city of Bridgetown. I don't got food today sharing my pot with you. Not every day is rainy for every fam family, not every day is sunny for every family. So, I say it in that context. 
Do I believe that we can do it? Yes, I do. But it means that instead of me being at this pulpit, as Pastor Elysius Joseph said a few weeks ago at our annual conference, it now needs to be cascaded. So I need you to come and speak to the people that you are speaking to and to do it. I need George, you, to belong to a cricket club and go to two, three afternoons a week and make sure that that boy who father in prison or whose mother ain't really talking to him or he don't see her often enough that you are there to be able to respond. I need you, Jeddah, to look at creating a community group. These are the things that will make the defining difference to the Barbados in which we live. When I went to Trent's summer youth camp, there were older men and older women, younger men and younger women, giving of their time, all the time. When my uncle Elombe had Yoruba, how many people went in Yoruba and learned to dance and drum? And today I go all over Barbados and tell me if it wasn't for your uncle, I would have ended up X place, Y place. This is what we need. And the good news is, it doesn't need the consent of the Americans or the British or the Europeans. It just needs the commitment of each of us individually.